Please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. We have come into the presence of God, who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Holy, holy, Let us pray. Almighty God and Father, dwelling in majesty and mystery, filling and renewing all creation by your eternal spirit and manifesting your saving grace through our Lord Jesus Christ, in mercy, cleanse our hearts and lips that free from doubt and fear, we may ever worship you, one true immortal God, with your Son and the Holy Spirit, living and reigning now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Now I invite children of the congregation to come forward for a children's message. Good morning. Go ahead and sit down there if you'd like. I had a question for you this morning. Have you ever uh, planned a party? Have you ever had a party? Yeah, you haven't had a party before? Yeah, like a birthday party or a sleepover party or something like that where you have friends come over. Tell me, what, what's the, what do we have to do when we plan a party? There's some things we have to do. I think, first of all, we want to make a list of who we want to come to the party, right? Whether it's our friends or maybe our neighbors or maybe some cousins and family we want to come to our party. So we make a list of who we want to come. Uh, what's the next thing we do? We, we got to make invitations, right? Maybe you help mom or dad or grandma or grandpa. You help fill out invitation. It says when the party is, where the party is, uh, and what you need to bring, what you need to do to come to the party. Finally, after you make your list, make your invitations, what do you need to do with the invitations? You need to send them, right? You've got to send them in the mail. You've got to put a stamp on them. And where do you take them? You take them to the post office, and the mail carrier, he takes your, your envelopes and your invitations, and he delivers them to the people you want to come to the party, Right? Let's just say your party is uh, going to be happening tomorrow and the mail, mail carrier has to send the invites out, but he says, ah, it's going to rain today. I don't feel like I'm going to send out your invitations. How would you feel about that? That wouldn't be very good, would it? What if the mail carrier said, oops, 
I lost them. I lost your invitations to the party. Well, that wouldn't be very good, would it? What if the mail carrier or the mail person said, oh, I forgot. I was doing some other things. I was watching uh, some Netflix and some TV, and I just forgot to send out your invitations to your party, so no one's going to come. How would you feel about that? Would you feel good or bad? You feel pretty bad, right? You feel pretty bad. Um, there's a, a saying that uh, the mail, mail carriers don't do that, thankfully. When you give them mail to send, invites to send, they always send them. They say, in rain or snow or, or sun or wind, the, the mail people always send out your mail, your invites to your party. The reason we talk about that is because in a little bit you're going to hear pastor talk about and, and read from the Bible an invite that Jesus is sending. And not just Jesus, but today we're talking about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That, that's our God, right? And it can be hard to understand. We have one God, but there's three persons, right? Maybe a way to think about it is like this. There's three persons. Can you do that? Put up three fingers like that. Three. And then turn it sideways. One. One God. Three persons. One God. That's our God. And our, our triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, is inviting people to a party. You know where that party is? Take a guess. Where's the party? Up in, in heaven. Very good. And guess what? He's taking care of all the planning, and he's already paid. There's nothing you have to do to go to the party. He's died on the cross to take our sins away. And he says, you can come to my party in heaven. It's going to be the best party ever. It's going to last forever. It's going to be awesome. And guess what? You were invited to that party already. Do you know when you were invited to that party? I'll give you a hint. It's right behind you. When you were baptized. Very good, Emmy. Yeah, when, when you were baptized, God gave you that invitation and he put it in your heart and he said, you're, you're now uh, uh, invited to the party of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In fact, we began, we began our worship service with that today. We begin in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And you're invited to that party in heaven. But guess what? Are you the only ones invited? Who's invited? Everybody. Very good. Your friends, your family, your cousins, your neighbors, everybody's invited. And guess who God is using as the mail carriers for the invites? Guess who God wants to mail his invites? You. God's saying, I want you to take the message and share it with the world. And he says, everybody's invited. Now, can you imagine if we told God, well... I don't feel like it today. I don't watch some, some TV maybe instead of tell people about the party. Or maybe I, I just kind of forgot about the party and I have other more important things to do. Do you think that would make God very happy? No, it doesn't. But thankfully, God forgives those sins too. And he says, I just want you to be as excited to tell people about the party as I am as excited to have you come to that party. Okay? So when you tell people about Jesus, don't worry, don't have to be scared or afraid or shy when you tell people about Jesus' party. You can just be like, be like the mail carriers and just invite. Just invite them and say, God loves you and there's a party in heaven and he already invited you by taking your sins away. Okay? So let's keep that in mind this week as we, uh, maybe if you're coming to soccer camp or maybe, uh, maybe there's other things you're doing, uh, you meet people. Uh, this week, your friends and family, remember to be Jesus' mail carriers and invite them to the party in heaven. Let's say a prayer right now, okay? And let's ask God to bless us. Can you fold your hands with me and bow your heads? Every time we pray, Jesus listens to what we say. Dear Father, dear Son, dear Holy Spirit, you are our God and you love us so much. You love us so much that you died on the cross to invite us to the party in heaven that will last forever. We're excited to go to that party, but Lord, you also want us to tell other people about the party. So help us to see opportunities to share your love and to invite other people to, to know you and to come to heaven with you one day. Um, please bless us today, Lord, as we worship in your house and strengthen our faith and our hearts and our love. Amen. Thank you. You guys can go sit back down. We turn our hearts and minds to the lessons from God's Word. In the first lesson, we see the account of 
creation, the historical account of how God brought all things into being, you're going to notice a couple of things. Today we read this on Trinity Sunday because there are a number of references to our one God being three persons. You'll notice that at the beginning. You'll hear about the Word, which is Jesus, uh, God the Father, and then also God the Holy Spirit. You'll hear it at the end where God has a conversation among himself. Uh, the one God has a conversation among the three persons saying, let's create people in our image. But probably the best thing that you can notice as we go through this whole account of creation is that um, you're going to see how amazingly mighty and wise God is. And that could be really scary if you think about it. But at the end, when he creates people, when he brings us into being, you can see the love and the relationship that he wants to have with people. He's not just a wise God, he is a loving God. A lesson from Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it. And it was so. God called the vault sky. And there was evening, and there was morning, the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land and the gathered waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years. And let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, let the water teem with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living thing with which the water teems and that moves about in it according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground, and the wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. 
Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. <coughs> then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing, so on the seventh day he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. The word of the Lord.
In the second lesson, we see the blessings that we uh, receive from our triune God. Grace, love, fellowship. A lesson from 2 Corinthians 13. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All God's people here send their greetings. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The word of the Lord. Please stand for the hearing of the gospel. Here we see that being a disciple, a follower of Jesus, means that we are adopted in to God's family. We bear the name of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We are adopted through baptism. We are kept in that family through the teaching of the word. The gospel according to Matthew chapter 28. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated for our hymn of the day.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and is with you all and always. Amen. The Word of God for this Trinity Sunday we're going to look at is from the Old Testament book of Numbers chapter 6. You can find the reading there on page 8 in your service folder. Dear brothers, dear sisters in Jesus Christ, it was 7.45 a.m. Sunday morning when the 911 call went out and there was a little tiny boat that had capsized and flipped a family of four into the icy cold dark waters of Lake Michigan, a mom, a dad, and, and two little girls. The police, the fire department, the, the Coast Guard, they, were, they, uh, they, they responded to the call, but, but none of them were able to make it there in time to save that family. Thankfully, they didn't need to because it just so happened on that same day in that little part of Lake Michigan, there was another boat on the water, 7.45 a.m. on Sunday morning, that saw the boat tip over and, and throw the family out into the water, and they sped over to them, picked them all up, and, and brought them to shore and saved their life. If you could pick one word, one word to describe that little family of four, mom and dad and the two little girls, what word would you choose to describe them? Lucky? Fortunate? Blessed? Would you say that they were blessed? That just in the nick of time, that other boat happened to be going by and, and save them at just the right time from drowning in that icy water Back in 2004, one of my best friends, Sam Larson, was kayaking with his father. Sam was a senior at this time, and he was up in Lake Superior in those icy cold waters. And it's not the first time Sam and his dad had gone up there lake kayaking. And if you've ever been up there, there's these really famous, uh, they're called sea caves. Not really, it's not the sea, but they're called sea caves. You can kind of, these caves that kind of... Uh, uh, follow the coastline there and you can get up and kayak right kind of next to them even underneath them a little bit and that's what sam and his dad were doing uh, on that uh, that one day in august and uh, sam got a little too close to the, the sea caves and the, the waves all of a sudden became too rough and they, they smashed sam up against the rocks and um, flipped his kayak over and the waves kept pushing him into the rocks and smashing his body into the rocks and the water was so cold. He kept fighting for two hours. He tried to get back in his kayak. His dad jumped into the water too and tried to get him back on the kayak and he just couldn't. He just ran out of strength, ran out of energy and after two hours, uh, they both looked at each other and they realized something very sad. They weren't both going to make it. And so in that moment, uh, Sam's dad had to make, I would imagine, the most difficult decision a dad would ever have to make in their life. He had to go back and swim for help. And so right there in the water, he kissed his son goodbye, and he said, I'll see you again. He prayed with him. He said, I'll see you either in a couple hours or I'll see you in heaven. And he swam away. And he swam for the shore, and he went there as fast as he possibly could, as tired as he was, and it was only about an hour and a half uh, response time by time he got back to shore and the police and fire and rescue and, and coast guard helicoptered out there even and they, they uh, med flighted Sam up out of the water in a way but because the waves had been so harsh and bashed him up against the rocks and because the water was so cold Sam didn't make it. He died. You could pick one word to describe what happened to Sam and his father. What would it be? Would you use the same word to describe that first family? Lucky? Fortunate? Would you say they were blessed? Obviously, those two situations are completely different. They're different outcomes and they evoke different emotions when you hear those, right? The reason I set those two stories right next to each other this morning because I want to ask you a question. Are you blessed? I think as Christians this morning, we probably all 
our knee-jerk response is to say, yeah, we're, we're Christians, we're blessed. I'm too, stressed to be, or too blessed to be stressed, right, is a, is a common Christian saying, right? But my follow-up question to that would be, when are you blessed? Are you blessed when a loved one makes it home from a long journey or a, a long vacation and they, and they arrive home safely? Are you blessed? Are you equally as blessed if they get into an accident? Are you blessed when you're surrounded by family and you're surrounded by friends who love you and care for you? Are you equally as blessed when you're alone and no one calls, no one comes to visit, no one really cares or knows what you're doing or where you are? Are you equally as blessed? Are you blessed when you find someone to spend your life with? Marry someone till death do us part. Are you equally blessed if you don't? Are you blessed when a, a baby is born into your family, healthy baby, a, a child or a grandchild is born? Are you equally blessed when that child is born with disabilities? When are you blessed in your life? Are you blessed in every situation? Are you blessed no matter what's going on in your life? God would say yes. And it's God's will and it's my prayer that by the time we walk out of church here this morning, all of us will too. And not just say that we're blessed, but know it and believe it with all your heart, dear Christian, that because God says it, because the triune God promises it, you are blessed. Let's read his word right now. If you turn to page 8 in your service folder, it's from Numbers chapter 6. The Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron and his sons, This is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. So they... That's the high priest will put my name on them and I will bless them. This is God's word. So you know the saying, it's a familiar saying, right? Uh, seeing is believing, right? It's kind of the way our world operates today, right? I, I won't believe it until I can see it, right? It's not the way God operates. Here in his family, in his kingdom, God actually takes that whole principle of seeing is believing and he flips it up on its head and he actually says, no, believing is not seeing, right? He says, believing is faith. You know that familiar passage about faith, right? Faith is being sure of what you hope for and, and certain of what you do not see. So where does faith start? With the eyes? Well, faith starts in the heart. Right? Faith is saying, even though I can't see it, because God says it, I believe it. And, and there's no greater uh, observation of that than on Trinity Sunday today. Right? Where we're dealing with something, we're, we're trying to understand something that not only can we not see God, now we can't even comprehend Him. We can't even understand God. The Bible says you have one God. We have one God. No exceptions, no alternatives. There is one singular God in the, in the universe. He made the universe. And yet that one God is three distinct persons. He is the Father, He is the Son, He is the Holy Spirit. God the Father is completely God, 100%. God the Son is completely the true God, 100% God, and, and God the Holy Spirit is the one true God, 100% and completely. They are that one God, and yet they are not each other. It's easy enough for us to explain to little children, even toddlers, right? Three in one. But to try to understand that is like trying to pour the ocean into a styrofoam cup, right? It, it, it's, it's too big. We, we can't comprehend what that means. And it goes beyond what we understand. And that's the challenge. 
Because I'm so prone to, and you're so prone to, I'll believe what I can see, and I'll trust it if I can understand it. So if I can't not only see God, but now I can't understand God, why should I believe God when he tells me this morning that no matter what you're going through, you are blessed? Because he does say that. Do you know that? God thinks you're blessed, and you actually do too. Well, at, least you, you, at least you say you do. At the end of every worship service, the pastor, Tio, and, and myself, we raise our hands and say, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. And what do you respond every time? Amen, right? Amen. What, what's that word mean? Yes. It, it's, a, it's a word that simply means, yep, I agree with what God just said. I agree that I am blessed. Well, do you? Not will be blessed. Do you agree that right now, whatever's going on in your life, you consider yourself blessed? That, that, that can be a, a very difficult challenge for you and me, right? Because just because God says that you and I are, are blessed, seeing is believing. And sometimes if I can't see it, I don't want to believe it, right? Take, for instance, the first time these words were spoken. Uh, it was actually 3,500 years ago from right where we are today. It was 3,500 years ago. The triune God put his blessing on his people, not as they were walking into a brand new home called the Promised Land and they were about to set up shop. It was about as they were about to wander out for four decades into a desert in a wilderness and God says, you're blessed. And I wonder if during that 40 years, they were thinking to themselves, hmm, are we? I know we will be, but are we right now in this hot desert, this wilderness of life? Are we, are we really blessed? And not only that, but take what happened right before this episode, right before God said these words. Do you know where we are in, in uh, Bible history? God's people were camped at the foot of a hill called Mount Sinai, and God had just given them a hard copy of the Ten Commandments. And before the ink was dry on that first commandment, you shall have no other gods. You know what they did? They chose another god. They, they actually made a cow out of their gold earrings and they worshipped the cow and said, this is the God who brought us out of Egypt. This is the God who loves us and saves us. And then God says, the Lord will bless you. And I wonder if they were tempted to think, really? After what we just did to him? Is God really going to bless us? I think it can be easy for you and me at the end of the worship service to hear the blessing being told and spoken on us. And maybe, maybe the day on Trinity Sunday we begin to think about what that means now. That the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, three times. That's the Trinity. Who He is and what He's doing. He's, he's blessing you. But it's harder to wrap your mind around this question who is God really going to bless when he says that? Because when you look at the context of when God first blessed those people and you think about what they had just done and what they were going through, you might be tempted to think, does, does God even realize who he was blessing? Did, did he really want to bless those people? And then you and I hear the blessing today at the end of worship and we, we know, at least I know, what I've done. You know what you've done and you think, does God know what I've done? Does God know the secrets I have? The kind of life I've lived and, and God's really going to bless me? And Maybe you feel like the Israelites wandering around in the desert. You're about to leave church today and, and wander back out in the desert of your life and you think, really, God has told me that I am blessed right now? I just don't feel it and I certainly don't see it. And maybe, Pastor, he's putting that blessing on the majority of the people here today. But if you really knew what was going on in my life, if you really knew the secrets I had to keep, if you really knew the sins that I had committed, if you really knew the difficulties and challenges that I'm facing, oh, he wouldn't call me blessed. He wouldn't say that about me. I don't know if you're feeling that way today. Maybe you're not. Maybe you are. Maybe you've been feeling that way for a while now in your life. 
Maybe you don't even recognize you've been feeling that way because when it gets towards the end of the worship service and you hear that blessing, you just kind of tune it out. And you've been saying to yourself, you know, I, I don't even listen to that blessing anymore. Now it's just more of a mile marker. It tells me that the church service is almost over. Do you know what the Almighty and the powerful God says to people who have a faith like that, a faith that says, I won't believe it until I see it? Not, not what pastor says about it, not what other people say, but do you know what the holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty says about people who care more about what's going on in their life, more about how they feel, more about what they do than what God says in the Bible? You know what God, the, the holy and almighty triune God says to those people? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Yeah, he says it again. He says the thing you've heard a thousand times in your life. Not because you don't know it, but because you need it. You need to hear it again. And when you hear it again today. Maybe for the first time. Maybe you're, hopefully you hear it in a way that you've never heard it before. Maybe pretend you're hearing it for the very first time. Not in a vacuum and not to a sea of faceless people, but in the context of what's going on in your life right now. The, the, the needs and the struggles, the doubts and the fears, the sins and the secrets. And you hear the Lord bless you. And you hear those words and maybe you notice something different you didn't notice before. That this blessing is not just about the Lord, the Lord, the Lord three times. And about what he's doing. There's another name in that blessing. In fact, that name is spoken even more than his own name. It's you. God says your name six times in that blessing. The Lord bless and keep you. And not you as a, as, as a group of, of people here today, but the word is singular. It's you. As though you're the only person in church this morning. And God is putting his blessing just on you. To the woman who takes stock of her life and looks around and, and doesn't seem to see God anywhere. And she thinks, if God's there, he's out to get me. Or maybe he's just forgotten about me like everyone else in my life. God the Father comes to her and says something to her that she has a hard time believing because she can't see it. He says, the Lord bless you and keep you. My dear daughter, I care for you. And I know you better than you know yourself. And no one and nothing can stop me or will be able to stop me from giving all my heart's blessings just to you. He's not speaking to a group of, group of people. He's saying it just to you. To the man who sees the past in his life and the present of his life and all he sees is a, a million reasons why God should be disgusted with him. And he's thinking to himself, I'm going to get what I deserve, not what God promises. And, and it's only a matter of time before God drops the hammer down on me that individual, God the Son, says something that he needs to hear because he has a hard time believing it and even seeing it. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. My son, God took all your sins and he put them on my back, Jesus says, and I, I carried them to the cross all alone it was my joy and my delight to take your place on the cross and die for you. Your sins are all gone. They're all forgiven. And now when God the Father, my Father, looks at you, he only beams. He only shines. To the teenager who feels all alone in this world, even though she's surrounded by people every day, she has the feeling that no one gets her and no one understands who she really is. And every day it's like she's drowning in a pool of her own anxiety and it seems like no one knows or no one cares what's going on in her life. And so God the Holy Spirit comes to her and, and he says something to her that she has a hard time believing because she can't see or feel it. He says, 
the Lord looks on you, the Lord turns his face toward you and gives you his peace. My child, I know who you are, he says, and I know you from the inside out. When no one else seems to know what's going on, I hear every cry, I catch every sigh. And I'm not just watching you, dear daughter. When you cry and when you sigh to me, I gather up those tears and I count them as prayers and I answer them for you. And every time you open your Bible, every time you think of one of God's promises, I'm right there to pour Jesus and his peace into your heart. And not just a big group of people. He says it just to you. And he doesn't just say it. He doesn't just say his blessing to you. When you and I bless someone or we wish someone well, good luck, take care, safe travels, hope it goes well. That's very nice, it's coming from our heart, but really what are we able to do with that? When the pastor at the end of a worship service says the Lord bless you and keep you, it's not well wishes. When those words come off the pastor's tongue, God immediately takes over and it's his job then and he carries it out. And he fulfills what he promises and he blesses what he offers and he gives that to you. And he says, so, so they will put my name on them and I will bless them. I will bless you, God says. So are you? Are you blessed? Right now? It might not feel like it. It might not even seem like it. Whatever you're feeling, whatever you're seeing going on in your life right now, set those things aside. Step away from those thoughts and feelings and grasp God's almighty word this morning. You might not be able to understand the triune God, but you can trust him. You can trust him because the God who created the universe is the one who sustains it all and holds it for you. And the God who judges sin justly is the one who already paid for all your sins in himself, in in Jesus. And the God who, who claimed you as his own says, I'll never leave you or forsake you and I'll bring you home to heaven. I promise. You can trust God to bless you. At the end of the worship service today, when you hear those words, listen and believe when God says, you are blessed. Because he's not just saying it. God, your triune God, is blessing you. Amen. May the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and again the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you as God blesses you. Amen. I invite you to stand at this time in our worship service as we do something a little unique this morning. I think usually we speak the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed on a Sunday morning. There's another creed out there called the Athanasian Creed, and it's, it's a creed that focuses on, on two false teachings about your triune God back in the fourth century. And a man named Athanasius wrote this creed to defend the honor and glory in the name of the triune God. So we're going to speak just part of that this morning together, uh, found on pages 8 and 9 of your service folder. And just note the headings of, of when the appropriate response for you to speak. Whoever wishes to be saved must, above all else, Hold to the true Christian faith. Whoever does not keep this faith pure in all points will certainly perish forever. Now this is the true Christian faith. We worship one God in three persons and three persons in one God without mixing the persons or dividing the divine being. For each person, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is distinct. But the deity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is one, equal and co-eternal in majesty. What the Father is, so is the Son, and so is the Holy Spirit. The Father is uncreated, the Son uncreated, the Holy Spirit uncreated. The Father is infinite, the Son infinite, the Holy Spirit infinite. The Father is eternal, the Son eternal, the Holy Spirit eternal. Yet they are not three who are eternal, but there is one who is eternal. Just as they are not three who are uncreated, nor three who are infinite, 
but there is one who is uncreated and one who is infinite. within this trinity, none comes before or after, none is greater or inferior, but all three persons are co-equal and co-eternal, so that in every way, as stated before, all three persons are to be worshipped as one God, and one God worshipped as three persons. Whoever wishes to be saved must have this conviction of the trinity. You may be seated as we gather our offerings of thanks and offerings of love to our triune God. This morning in our prayers, we'd like to have a special prayer, uh, asking God's blessing on our soccer camp this week and our sharing of his word uh, during that time. Please stand for prayer. Gracious Lord, we praise and thank you for your grace, your grace that gives us so many opportunities to to be in the word ourselves, and then also to be able to, to take that word, the good news of Jesus, and share it with others. In that light, we ask that you would bless our gospel sharing this week at our soccer Bible camp. Um, as we ask that you would um, bless the, the coaches and the leaders and all of the volunteers so that they not only have a, an enjoyable time and a positive time, but also have many opportunities to, to share your love with, with words and actions. Please bless the, the devotions that we have, the interactions that we have, so that your powerful gospel 
uh, goes right to the hearts of, of kids and parents and grandparents alike so that they may know you and your true love even more. We thank you for this great opportunity and all the kids that you have, have put it before us. We ask that we would glorify your name in all that we do. Triune God, you are the one eternal God whose name we praise forever. We wouldn't have known you, our only Savior, if you had not revealed yourself to us as Father, Son, and Spirit, three persons, yet one God. Please remove from us all unbelief and grant us a humble faith as we contemplate this high and holy mystery. Scatter all those who are wise in their own conceits and give us a simple, childlike trust to worship you as Trinity and unity and unity and Trinity. You are the God of glory, the God of grace, the God of every comfort. From you and through you and to you are all things. We rejoice to call you Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and to praise your holy name forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. <coughs> the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated for our closing hymn. Good morning. Thank you for being here in worship today. I know that God has blessed you as he's blessed me too. And as you go today, go this week, no, you don't have to understand God. You don't have to understand how he's three and one and one and three. But he knows you. And all his promises to you are real and they are true and they are forever. So go with God's blessings. This day and this week, uh, God goes with you. Uh, We're going to view, since we have the ability and the capability now, uh, we're going to view this month's edition of the Wells Connection. It's a, it's a short video clip that helps keep us connected to the greater part of family where we belong to in the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod and to see what our, our offerings, our mission offerings, are being used to help um, fund uh, and also to help carry out the gospel to more than just Hastings. So we'll view that right now.
Hello, Hello. I'm Pastor Pastor Keith Keith Free, Free, the administrator of Home Missions. Missions. A church is a communion and a community, and people people want community. community. A place where people know you, where everyone cares about your well-being. For a new mission congregation, knowing how to create this kind of community is vital, as the pastor and members look to tell more people about Jesus Christ. Castle Rock, Colorado is growing. It's been repeatedly listed as one of the best places in America to live. And that means new families are arriving here almost every day. That sets up an ideal situation for a mission church, as young families in transition look to put down roots. We were new to the neighborhood, new to the area. We just walked in some Sunday morning and were just greeted with uh, open arms, um, down-to-earth people, and just a very welcoming community feel. Yeah, you don't have a meter checker, do you, for that? Like for the- Our Wells mission here is Eternal Rock Lutheran Church, led by Pastor Jared Oldenburg. Like most young missions, this group does not yet have a church building. Instead, they worship in a rented space each week. But that hasn't slowed the work. So I thought, you know, with my husband, I said, let's just try it. Let's see what this all entails. And we came and we love it and we love serving and we just, we love everything about this church. Building a mission congregation is often a long road. Reverend Oldenburg arrived here seven years ago with three resources, the Word of God, his family, and the support of Wells. In the early days, it's especially helpful for a mission pastor to know he has the encouragement of Wells members everywhere as we all walk together. There's a lot of times where you feel completely alone. For me personally, there's a lot of encouragement to know that there is a, there's a group of people that is not just rooting for you, there's a group of people that are praying for you and they want your mission to do well. Each home mission begins by working to understand the unique features and needs of its community and then finding the best opportunities to share the gospel. In Castle Rock, one thing young families are looking for is personal connections, opportunities for authentic relationships. I think more and more when you talk about themes of authenticity and community, people want a place where they can feel like these are my friends. They can go there and say, I know this person, I know that person. And and the way that you do that is through shared experience. One way this congregation built a shared experience was here at the local movie theater as they screened the new movie, Martin Luther, A Return to Grace. The festive atmosphere brought people together for fellowship, fun, and a deeper understanding of the Lutheran Church. So thankful that all of you are here, and I'm excited for a great night. So we're going to get started up in just a minute or two. I cannot and I will not retract anything. The film, oh man, it was just so well done to know that Christians don't rely on how good they are. That's probably the biggest takeaway for me. God has forgiven it all. It was a very good movie to, I'm sure for people that already know about Martin Luther and for people that don't know anything like me. It's just a great opportunity to see other families, see other kids, um, and just kind of have that social interaction with them outside of church. Screening the new Luther movie is just one of dozens of ways this mission church is building community and strengthening relationships. There are seminars on marriage and parenting. Yes, Thomas, it's called a miracle. Kids camps on art and music, service projects, and of course, Bible classes. All those efforts are in support of the congregation's primary goal, preaching the word and administering the sacraments to as many people as possible. How does our home missions decide where to plant new missions in order to tell more people about Jesus? Often that process starts with people like you. Wells members see opportunities and pass information to their district mission board. The boards then follow up on those ideas. By God's grace, since 2013, more than 30 new home missions have started where connections with the Lord becomes the most important community. To learn more about home missions, visit wells.net.
those are really good. I don't know about you, but it's nice to know we belong to a family of believers. And, you know, St. John's was a mission church 150 years ago too, right? We just started just like that church. And it's good for us to remember that we have that same mission we once did when we first started, to bring people to come and grow and live in Jesus too. So let's continue to do that together as God's family. Uh, Have a wonderful week.